Good evening, everyone, especially to our distinguished speakers, Professor Nancy Steinart and Professor Wei Jian. Um, welcome to this Princeton and Yale ID se Ideas Series event um, held at the Yale Center Beijing, but also online, um, being live streamed over Princeton University Press's um, WeChat channel and Yale Center Beijing's Weibo channel. Welcome to everyone who are here in person and also online. Um, just a bit of the Yale Center about the Yale Center. Um, in case you're not familiar, we were founded in 2014, so around 10 years ago, um, as Yale University's only university-wide center outside of its U.S. campus. So it's it also functions um, as an embassy for its 15, uh, actually now 14 schools um, uh, throughout the year. Um, every two days or so, we host events such as these, where we convene academics and leaders from all sectors to discuss on the most interesting, cutting-edge topics um, in the world. Um, and today, we are so um, delighted um, to be working on this event in collaboration with the Princeton University Press's Beijing office to talk about <laughs> Professor Nancy Steinert's um, new book, Yuan um, for the Yuan Dynasty in China, Chinese architecture in a Mongol empire. Um, and um, we're also delighted to have Professor Wei Jian, Professor Emeritus from Redmond University of China to um, give a commentary in Chinese um, as um, a counterpoint to this discussion. Um, this talk is the third lecture of the Princeton Yale Ideas series. And um, I would really love to thank the Princeton University Press Beijing uh, office team, as well as the Yale Center Beijing team um, for um, bringing these fresh, new, um, and interesting ideas to the Beijing and um, Chinese audience. Um, today's um, event will go as follows. Um, I'm welcoming and um, everyone and delivering some short opening remarks and introducing the speakers. Um, later, we will have um, Professor Steinart talk about her book. Um, and then Professor Wei will be um, providing commentary in Chinese. Um, afterwards, we will have a Q&A session, um, folks joining online um, and folks um, at the uh, venue at Yale Center Beijing, you're welcome to raise your hands both physically and virtually um, to get your questions answered. Um, so uh, a bit of an introduction about the two professors today. Um, Professor Nancy Steinart is one of the foremost um, experts on Chinese architectural history. Um, she is the Professor of East Asian Art and Curator of Chinese Art at the University of Pennsylvania, where she has taught since 1982. She received her PhD at Harvard and was a junior fellow at Harvard. Um, Steinart is, uh, Professor Steinart is uh, an author or co-editor of many different um, books and volumes about Chinese architectural history, including Chinese traditional architecture, Chinese Imperial City Planning, Liao Architecture, Chinese Architecture Reader in Traditional Chinese Culture, Chinese Architecture and the Beaux-Arts, Chinese Architecture in an Age of Turmoil 200 to 600, The Chinese Mosque, Chinese Architecture, 12 Lectures, China and Architectural History, The Borders of Chinese Architecture, and um, the book that's the subject of today's talk, Yuan, Chinese Architecture in the Mongol Empire, and more than 100 articles. She has also won many um, teaching and writing uh, and book awards, including the Distinguished Teaching of Art History Award from the College Art Association, the Provost Award for Distinguished PhD Teaching and Mentoring from Penn. Um, and in 2021, she won the Alice David Hitchcock Book Award from the Society of Architectural Historians for Chinese Architecture a History. Following Professor Steinart's presentation, we're gr grateful to have Professor Genway to comment and reflect on um, Professor Steinart's presentation. 
Professor Wei Jian is Professor Emeritus of History at Renmin University of China, where he also serves as Director of the Institute of Northern Ethnic Archaeology and Head of the Department of Archaeology and Museology. He is currently a Distinguished Professor at Minzu University of China and the Director of the Institute of Frontier Archaeology. He has led over 80 archaeological excavations, including that at uh, Yuanshangdu in uh, Neimeng Guo, Inner Mongolia, which was um, designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2012. To date, he has published many academic monographs and more than 180 papers and research reports um, on his topic of expertise. Um, without further ado, um, let's welcome Professor Starnart to give her presentation on the book. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Carol, for that very kind introduction. And thank you, everyone who has come tonight or this morning um, to hear about Yuan architecture. The book that I'm going to talk about deals with the architecture of a period of approximately 150 years. From the death of this man, Genghis Khan, in 1227, through the fall of the Yuan dynasty to the Ming dynasty in 1368. This is the age of Kublai Khan. This is the age of uh, his, also the age of Marco Polo. By the end of the 13th century, the empire forged by Genghis and enlarged by his sons and his grandsons would be and remains the largest empire ever achieved in Eurasia. It was also the first time in history when China was part of a much larger empire and that empire was not ruled by someone of Chinese descent. As the 12th century turned into the 13th century, that is around the year 1200, at least 12 polities, you see them on the map, populated the area that you see here from Siberia uh, through Korea, including China and as far west as the Black Sea. In that year, circa 1200, the man who would become Genghis Khan was about 38 years old. Before he died in 1227, in Ningxia Hui, so he dies right around here. China, uh, Genghis would engage in battle and conquer and unite most of the people in the region you see on the map. He would unite the Mongols, the Tartars, the Karyat, the Merkit, the Naaman, the Unga, the Kyrgyz, Par Khwarazm, uh, Karakitai, the Karakhanid, Kipchuk, Western Xia, the Jurchen, and of course, Song China. And when Genghis dies just one quarter of the way into the 13th century, the city Zhongdu, that is the Jin Dynasty city, would have fallen to the Mongols. Kara Kitai over here would fall. Western Xia would fall. And Khwarezm, which is over here, would also fall. These are the historical facts, but the narrative around them is often exaggerated and glorified by images like this and the narrative that grows around it. So let's take this statement. The Mongols first saw cities on horseback. This clear and direct statement does not carry the meaning that the Mongols stormed across the grasslands until they came to a walled city, which they leveled to the ground, whose booty they took, and whose population they slaughtered or enslaved. Even though a scene that this describes, or a scene like the one you see on the screen, often illustrates a statement like that. The statement is not even true if we soften it to the Mongols first encountered Chinese walled cities in the conquest of sedentary people to their south. The true statement is long before the plowed fields or granaries or armories came into view, the Mongols saw ceramic tile roof eaves 
carved stone, and occasionally pagodas. If no longer attached to buildings or parts of larger complexes, they saw them amid ruins like this. They saw them inside standing walls. The 12th and 13th century peoples of Mongolia, from who rose the leaders and the shapers of the Mongol Empire, surely first saw architecture on horseback, but they saw it right in Mongolia. They saw it here. They saw remains of cities built by the Liao. They saw remains of architecture built by Uyghurs in Xinjiang. They saw remains of architecture built by Western Xia in Neymang. And they saw perhaps remains like this, if not in Tongwan, then remains of walls in the north from as early as the fifth century, maybe even from earlier. They also they saw roof tiles, they saw pieces of ceramic, and it's through all of this that we understand this period not as a clash of civilization, but as a movement of the Mongol South and a decision about what to build. So yes, the Mongols definitely destroyed cities, some of Asia's most magnificent cities. They destroyed Bukhara and Samarkand and Ray and Hamadan and Maraga and Gurganj and Merv and Nishapur and Bamiyan. But they also rebuilt many of those cities, sometimes using old building parts. And one of the things that I try to do in this book is rely only on facts or on excavated evidence. Fortunately, there is a tremendous amount of remaining physical evidence, buildings like this. There is in fact a remarkably comprehensive history of extant architecture in and around China from the period of Mongolian rule. There are dozens of cities and towns, there are hundreds of wooden buildings, and there are buildings in other materials. So for instance, buildings I just showed you, buildings in other materials such as these. There are paintings of buildings and paintings of parts of buildings, many of which, and I'll show you this this morning, many of which have fairly reliable facts. There are, in fact, some excellent paintings of buildings. There are the buildings that people have turned to, to say, well, Chinese architecture really changed under Mongol rule. We'll look at these also. The book examines them also, and I will show you how they become part of the building tradition. There is rock carved architecture from the period of Mongolian rule. And there are a few very unusual buildings. I call them anomaly buildings, buildings that are almost unique in the history of Chinese architecture. And there are also buildings in Korea and in Japan and in Iran. But I start with maps. I start with maps because it's an efficient way to lay out the land and to show that Chinese map makers were very aware of this dynasty called Yuan and very able to locate in their maps places like the capital Dadu or Shangdu. I start with the great capitals. I'm not talking about them this morning. These cities are very well known, but I do certainly discuss them in the book. Just as a point of reference, the city that Kublai built as his great capital, Dadu, or pronounced at the time Daidu, was 28,600 meters uh, uh, in perimeter. So this actually is more than six times the perimeter of the wall of Karakoram, the first capital in Mongolia, and it is more than two and a half times the outer wall of this of Shangdu, that's the capital that it will come up again. This is where the Xanadu of Coleridge's poem 
And then there is the fourth capital. These will all come up a little bit later. But they're all, they've all been studied. They're all on the map. So here, Holin or Karakoram. Here, Shangdu. So Holin, Shangdu, Daidu, of course, right here. And Zhongdu, the short-lived capital, right here. But there are many cities. There are more than 30 cities, and they are all built, rebuilt, or used by the Mongols. And you see just from this, these plans, to now, uh, this morning I'm showing more color illustrations than black and white, but you see wall inside wall, you see the capital I-shaped or gong-shaped plan, you see long streets, and you see layout that includes palatial architecture. So here's where all these places are. In fact, each of the cities labeled on this map was a city that was used by the Mongols and each one comes up at least in small part in the first part of the book. The maps were a challenge. You see on the screen how I decided to do them. In part, what you're seeing is that cities clustered during uh, the Yuan Dynasty. So a cluster here, this is in Waimang, cluster here around Shangdu. This is here is I'm in Ningxia, and here I'm in Xi'an and Beijing, Daidu, of course, is over here. But after talking about cities, and as I said, we won't, we'll be looking mainly in color, the second part of the book looks at what the Mongols saw as they came to China. I think it's very important, one of the facts, to look at what the Mongols themselves would have seen could have, that could have impacted them. And here, I think, is the most complicated map that I show in this book, locations of pre-1250 cities and buildings where the Mongols were that we knew that they saw. So you take this and you see this detail and here's the detail and here are the details. And I had a graduate student architect draw these for me. It takes some time to look, but you can see that the Mongols used cities and a few of them well-known, the city that the Jin used as their capital beneath Beijing today under Daidu, but also cities that are today in Russia, a uh, city in uh, Heilongjiang, and this one is also in Russia. So I do look at the Jin somewhat, and I look at important Song and Jin buildings. I look at them, I look at the buildings that I select from Song and Jin for two purposes. One, to show that yes, the architecture that the Mongols built, an example of it is behind me on the screen right now, draws from Chinese architecture. But more importantly, I show that it uses the Chinese building standards. And so what do I mean by this? These are the two grandest buildings that the Mongols built, Qiyang Bei Yuan Miao De Ning Dian, and uh, the Yonggu Gong, this is the Sanqing Dian of Yonggu Gong. These are by Chinese definition, Dian Tang. So I select my, my pre-Yuan buildings so that I can show in the book that the building standards of China are very much used in the Yuan dynasty. So I turn to Ying Zhao Fa Shure, and yes, well, this is very simple, that Dian Tang is a big hall. But when I go through building parts, which I also don't do tonight, but I do in the book, I show the use of Dian Tang. I also look at literary descriptions of buildings when they exist. But in the end, I, all, I rely mostly on archeological evidence because sometimes texts are written by people who did not see buildings. Tao Tsongyi's Chuo Gong Lu is one. It's by someone who was living in the South and used records to describe Yuan Daidu, but Xiao Shun did see the Yuan capital, 
And this is the text that he wrote, the Gu Gong Yi Lu. He came and he saw what survived of Kublai Khan city before it was destroyed to make way for the Ming dynasty. Excellent reconstructors using those texts have proposed what the palaces of Daidu might have looked like. This is a signature Fushinian reconstruction that shows the Daming Palace complex. But looking at the description of the Daming Palace complex, we can turn to one of the two Dientang, one of the two grand halls. And so this is Bei Yuan Miao, the Dining Hall, and we can read the description that goes. Daming Hall was raised on, <clears throat> excuse me, a high platform with a stairway in front of it. Okay, this is Dining Dian. I'm reading the description of the Daming Hall. In what, it, a, it, a marble balustrade carved with figures of dragons and phoenixes surrounded the hall. Each vertical post of the balustrade rested on an owl, a sea dragon-like creature. So balustrades, the creature. He mentions the dragons in the panels. They don't survive here, but excavated from Yuan Da Du. You do have a panel with the dragon. These are the sea dragon headed pieces that have been found not just at the remains of Daidu, but in Shangdu and in Zhongdu and in Karakoram as well. Let me keep going with this description. Every exterior pillar of the hall was decorated with raised flowers, golden dragons, and clouds, on top of which were carved decoration. Here I have to go to the Song Dynasty. To find those dragons around pillars, I have to go to Jinsu, Shangmu Dian. But then the text tells us, a pair of dragons coiled in the center of the ceiling. And here I'm back in Chuyang, the Ning Dian. I'm looking at coiling dragons. Golden and red mullioned windows with gold leaf attached to the intervening, intervening spaces was found on all four sides of the hall. And so the mullion windows found on the four sides of the hall, here De Ning Dian, and here I'm at Yong Lu Gong, San Qing Dian. In the book, because I'm writing in English and I'm always writing for a reader who may not have a lot of background, I also explain that in the Yuan Dynasty, two sets of brackets between those on top of columns is standard. And this is part of the evolution of the bracket set from the Renzo Gong to just one intercolumnar bracket to many in the 18th century. And then I can turn to a very casually painted uh, mural from Chirfeng, from a tomb in Chirfeng, pillar, pillar, one, two bracket sets, pillar, pillar, two bracket sets. The evolution of Chinese architecture and the criteria for a UN building very much is followed. And I also explain during this part of the book, as I'm getting ready to look at actual wooden buildings, where the UN bracket set sits in the evolution, the fact that the bracket set is about a sixth of the total height from ground level to top, and that there are artificial pieces, pieces that are not functional, that are used in the bracket set. And so back here at Yongbo Gong, San Qing Dian, we see those artificial pieces. We can see them in a sarcophagus as well. Now I move into the timber frame hall, which is one of the most important parts of the book. And so we start at the top, Dian Tang, and then I move to buildings that are most eminent to buildings that are somewhat less eminent. The simple hipped roofs, and I move to the hip gable roofs. And of course, at some point, I have to explain most eminent roof is a hipped roof. Then we go to hip gable. But when there are the decorative pieces on the top, more eminent than this. 
Then we move in eminence to the overhanging eaves. So here with the decoration, here just with the eaves themselves. And I explain that pavilions take on their own architectural features. This is then what I do. This is how I've decided to organize timber frame buildings. So that we looked at the Dian Tang at Yongbogong and at, and at uh, Chuyang, Bei Yuan Miao. Then we looked at the next rank of building. Now I move still to the next rank of building, uh, the building with the hip and the gable. And then I move just to overhanging gables. And then I am able to talk about other features of architecture that are exclusive to the Yuan dynasty. One of them is the Jianju or the elimination of pillars from the inside of a building. And so you have this here. I don't illustrate any Ming buildings in the book, but for point of reference, by the Ming dynasty, the complete column grid is very much in place, 1424. So there is something Yuan, and yes, a person can recognize the features of a Yuan building from this book. But I'm always looking to show in this chapter that Ying Zhao Fa is used in a wooden building in the Yuan dynasty. So here I'm looking at the Ta Dao from Ying Zhao Fa Here I'm looking at the Ta Dao from a Yuan dynasty residential mansion in Daidu. And here's a line drawing, and here I see it in a painting. So you can see the kinds of material I'm using to confirm a text when I have a text to use. I've just mentioned painting. I think a lot of you know that the kind of painting I was describing is called Jiehua, translates as ruled line painting. In fact, in Mongolia, from fairly early in the Yuan period, possibly as early as the time of uh, Genghis. At this site, a ruler was found. So rulers are very much in use in Mongolia during the Yuan dynasty. Other pieces of wood and other examples where wall painting can confirm what's been excavated. You saw this already, relief panels, here I'm at Yongbogong, Xuanyang Dian, excavated in Daidu, Ho Ying Fang. I'm looking at this door with this latticing. I see it right here. So I start in the north and then I move to the south and I use only four buildings. It's always necessary to select. There are more than 300 Yuan Dynasty wooden buildings that survive. So I look at the main ones uh, in the southeast at Yen Fu Se and at Jen Ru Se today and an older picture of it. I note the use of curved beams and uh, other cu longer curved beams in the southeast. I talk about Tian Ning Se's main hall, but I'm always selecting so that there are among these 300, more than 300 probably wooden buildings, many that I didn't include. If it were a book about the Song Dynasty, I might've been able to include almost everything, but not true. So these are buildings where I've that I've studied in my many trips up and down the Fun River in Shanxi. They're not in the book. And this is the interior of uh, two of them not in the book. I decide to talk about kind of the mainstream, the standard architecture that's not a, that's not Dantong and not associated with China's most important buildings from Hanchang. So it's a chance to talk about this fantastic city Hanchang used by officials, not by emperors. And I talk about uh, Ting Tang or Ting Tang from there. These buildings are discussed in the book and these buildings are discussed in the book. And I also discuss a few buildings from Sichuan 
and uh, one from Yunnan in the book. So these buildings are in the book. In all, I discuss about 50 of the 300 or so buildings. And I talk about architecture in other materials, both in stone and in metal. And then I move at the very end of the book, but I show the material here to architecture in Korea that follows the Chinese building standards. So these three buildings are contemporary with the Yuan Dynasty in Korea. And I talk about a few Japanese buildings, very specific type that are also built contemporary with Yuan China. So as I said, I start with Dantong, then I move to Tingtong, and then I move to smaller buildings. And for my examples of smaller buildings, I use houses. This is the oldest house in China. It is from um, the Yuan Dynasty. And I look at stages. And the stages sometimes have very fantastic ceilings. Some of the stages I don't include. I only include, the, I, I might mention them, but I don't include them. These are not illustrated in the book. But in all, right now, it's believed there are 24 stages just in Shanxi province. And so that's how I move to talk about small architecture and buildings with plans like this. Then I move to tombs. So I have select about 30 tombs from the many that I could include as just as illustrations, the, these two drawings and this drawing to show the tombs are primarily but not exclusively one chamber. They can, that chamber can be circular, it can be uh, uh, hexagonal, can be octagonal, and sometimes there are more interesting tombs. And this is where I again look underground and look at murals in part because I'm interested in murals in part because they enliven the book and sometimes there is architecture in the murals, sometimes important architecture that shows you the way that a painter replicated the grains of wood. Sometimes there are ceilings that show features that would have hung in silk, but now are put into uh, the, the ceiling itself. And then there are a few unusual tombs, one in, this one in Beijing, a few unusual features in brick tombs. That's all discussed in the section on tombs. And then in my discussion of the smaller architecture, I look at a few sarcophaguses and pieces of sarcophaguses this was excavated by Wei Jian in Shangdu. And then I move to the part of the book that I think that readers might find the most interesting. And so I'm going to spend more time now from now till the end, looking at some of the unusual buildings. And I choose this because when I first thought about Yuan and when people think about Yuan, they're always looking for something that shows the Mongols were there and many Chinese were there as well. These are mosques. These are considered China's four oldest mosques. Uh, this one has a lot of rebuilding. It's an old site, but it's not as old. And if you've never looked at a Chinese mosque, these are also pictures from them. Uh, if you, you notice Persian, then you know you're at a mosque. But if you take away the placard, you see that, yes, Chinese building is very much the system. I'm going to talk about three of them this morning. So I start here at the Huaisheng Se, uh, the mosque that glorifies or about the flourishing of the sage. Sheng refers to Muhammad. This mosque is well known because of its minaret. The minaret is called Guangta. The first important fact, and it's a fact, not a feature, of bringing foreign architecture into China is that it has to become part of the Chinese system. So the word ta, which is word for pagoda, becomes used for a minaret. And yes, this defines it as a non, it is definitely a non-Chinese structure. 
It's tall. Some people think one of its functions was a lighthouse and that that's the reason that it was called Guang. Others say this is just the brightness of the faith. Now I don't have a label. So take a moment to look at these plans, which is the mosque. Well, you saw that there's a minaret. This of course is the minaret in the mosque. But other than that, you have a gate. You have a T-shaped approach. Think about Beijing, Daidu had a T-shaped approach. Also, you have a large yuatai, large platform, and you have a building. This is a building from Liao Jin period in Datong, Shanghua Se. And so you have buildings with Yuatai, and you have, of course, the courtyard. This is the, the second feature that tells you it's a mosque. This is the mihrab that points to Mecca in the West. So to enter, a person has to walk along the corridor or walk outside and then come inside. But this plan is a Chinese plan. It's not to conceal the fact that this is a mosque. The, the, the Guangta projected 37 meters high above the low built environment. It is because to be constructed in China, it has to become part of the Chinese system. So part of the Chinese system, this is what it looks like today. And this is rebuilding, a lot of rebuilding occurred in the 1930s. The second mosque that I show this morning, Feng Huang Se, in the city of Hangzhou. Uh, Phoenix is a bird that's associated with the city. You note here three domes. What, yes, three domes. This is a picture from a book. I couldn't have taken this one myself. Large central dome and two smaller ones, and perhaps shaped like a phoenix right here behind this building right here, right here would be the mihrab, the indicator of Mecca. What do we have inside? Well, we have the honeycomb squinches that are associated with Islamic architecture. If they look to you like bracket sets, yes, there's definitely, they don't derive from bracket sets, but a builder knew how to make this kind of cornice. This is what it looks like inside today. So here is how the builders, craftsmen who are Chinese are imitating uh, Mukarnas. But the three domes, there are famous three dome buildings that were constructed before this mosque. One is the Dashiong Baodian at Baoguose, and one is Yonggegong Sanqing Dian, the central dome being the most important. As for the name Phoenix, there was at least one other Phoenix Hall in East Asia, in Japan, the famous Phoenix Hall in Uji built earlier than the Phoenix Mosque, but it takes on the shape of a Phoenix and perhaps this was intended to imitate a Phoenix building. This is the most interesting, I think, of the Yuan Dynasty mosques. It's had a lot of rebuilding. The entry gate is dated 1799. It's the mo mosque has been moved. It's not considered one of the four oldest, but what I'm about to show you dates from the uh, 14th century before the fall of the Mongols. It's in Qinyang, in Hunan. These roof tiles, well, here we have Persian but the roof tiles are Chinese technique and amid Chinese roof tiles. And now we're inside the mosque and there's nothing here that says to you anything except the interior of a Chinese building. It is a very, very long building. You can see that from the side and in plan. And you can also see that Pillars are eliminated. This is standard for the Yuan dynasty so that if someone wants to open space so that there's enough room for people to worship on the floor, this is Chinese building practice. 
Again, this is the interior. These are five puts or bracket sets. But this is the reason that it's so interesting. I'm looking at this feature here. This is a fan, of course. I'm looking at this feature. I'm calling it cicada belly. If that's not familiar to you, here's the Chinese. This is Chandu. And before this, Chandu exists at Baogua Se. Chandu is explained in Ing Zhao Fa Shi and one of the very few early wooden buildings where it survives anywhere in China is at the mosque I just showed you. So how about the famous white pagoda? How does that become part of the Chinese building system? Yes, it stands very tall, something like 50 meters. It is definitely the kind of pagoda that was used in Tibet before the Mongols came to China. And as the story goes, Kublai asked his advisor, Pogspa, to give him some guidance in building a temple for the practice of Tibetan Buddhism in his capital. And Pogspa introduced him to Anige, born in Nepal, who had already built a monastery, uh, had already built monasteries for Tibetan Buddhism in Tibet. And Kublai meets Anige uh, in, already in 1262. He meets him in Chengdu. But construction doesn't begin that early. It's only in the year 1270, after Kublai is already in Daidu, uh, the construction begins in a large way in 1267. Kublai is already doing some building in 1263. He tells Anigen he wants to build this building. What does Kublai do before he built? And by the way, the technique of using plaster to cover a building and to make it circular that's in place. Builders in China know how to do this. When Kublai chooses his site, he determines the extent of the site by a practice known as siding by bowshot. This was used in Mongolia, both inner and outer Mongolia, to determine how much land a certain lord might get. So Kublai himself stands there and shoots in one direction and shoots in the other. That's how the, the extent of the White Pagoda Monastery is determined, but it has to be put in a Chinese building plan. This isn't Tibet, this is China. And so a hall is built in front of it and it becomes part of a configuration that traces to the sixth century in China. 517, Yongning Se, Gate Pagoda Buddha Hall, Korea, Nongsa, 6th century, Gate Pagoda Buddha Hall, Lecture Hall, Japan, Shitennoji, 593, Gate Pagoda Buddha Hall. The, here, the pagoda is behind the gate, but, the, and, but by the Ming Dynasty, these buildings are even post Ming. They didn't stand in the Yuan dynasty. I can't confirm that this is what it looked like in the Yuan dynasty. By the Ming dynasty, it becomes the pagoda that's enclosed in Chinese architectural space. The system is somewhat, it's comparable to what happens to the Guangta inside of a mosque. So, until today, the pagoda is within a Chinese courtyard setting. But this perhaps is the more interesting comparison. This is Yongregong. Here you can see the three halls, most important one with the hip roof. Here's a plan from a Difangzhur. This Difangzhur happens to date to 1812, but the main hall, whether it's a, da, a dientang or whether it's a ta, is enclosed in courtyard space inside a large built environment. 
And the same system is in practice for other foreign architecture. So this is the Beitong, built in the 18th century, rebuilt more recently with two steely pavilion in the front, enclosed in the architectural space of Chinese courtyards. So yes, I'm showing you buildings that confirm that the Mongols built in China, but that construction is always encompassed by Chinese architectural space. And there are a few other white pagodas in China. I talk about them in the book. And sometimes the Mongols return and make their mark in very early sites. So this is Gansu Binglingse, where there's architecture that dates to the fifth century. And this pagoda is carved during the Yuan Dynasty at the Binglingse. How about the observatory? This is a building that scholars have been interested in for a very long time because we know that Muslim craftsmen came from Persia to build here. We are in Hunan Dungfang near the Sacred Central Peak. The site surely is chosen because of the Sacred Central Peak. Well, the privilege of building an observatory is a privilege of Chinese kingship, rulership. It's the, the ruler, we're told in, in the Zhou dynasty, has the privilege of setting the calendar. That's why he needs an observatory. There are remains of spirit altars that were climbed to look at the stars and make predictions from the Han dynasty. So now we come to Kublai's time. And again, there's a text that talks about the process of building this observatory. Uh, I translate this as the text for granting the seasons or how to set the calendar. So the text is written 1280, but 1279 is when the observatory in Dongfeng first is constructed. And these two men are very influential, Liu Bingzhong. I didn't talk about it this morning, but Liu Bingzhong, Kublai's advisor, is the man who gave him the designs for his capitals, Daidu and uh, Shangdu. The famous engineer, Guo Shoujing, was involved in the construction of his observatory, certainly in Beijing, but probably the one in Dengfeng also. In fact, Shou Shirley tells us the names of the builders in the observatory, and uh, we can find out about them. Wang Xun had mathematical ability. Zhang Yi was a diviner, and he's implicated uh, in a murder, and he's eventually executed. Xu Hung is uh, a scholar. He's a Confucian scholar, but he retools in order to have a place in the government rather than a worse outcome that could have happened to a scholar in the Yuan dynasty. Zhang Wenqian had served Kublai since the 1240s. We don't know much about him. Yang Gongyi met Kublai in the 1270s at Shangdu, and he was involved in the use of astronomical instruments. And Chen Ding was an official who had participated in calendar reform at, uh, for the Southern Song Dynasty. Now I bring in these names. These names continue to come up in literature about the Yuan Dynasty by people who are seeking to show that foreign influences came into China. Foreigners came to China. These are people with foreign names. But I can find you and you can find people who say Yehe Dier was the architect of Daidu. He was not the architect of Daidu. Liu Bingzhong designed Daidu. Daidu is a Chinese uh, palace inside a Chinese uh, city, the palace inside the city. But Yehe Diyar worked on the design under the direction of other people. And each of these people worked on building projects in China. 
Names can be foreign, people can be foreign. That doesn't mean that foreign building is occurring. These are the two people who were most involved in the observatory in Daidu, the two who came from the West. One is Nasser al-Din. He worked for Munka, Kublai's older brother, and he also worked for Kublai's younger brother, Hulagu, who, uh, who moves west and sets up the Mongol dynasty in Iran, the Ilkhanate. He has biographies only in Western sources. But Jamal al-Din, who also had been an astronomer at Maraga, has a biography in Yuanshu. Uh, his name in Yuanshu is Jamal Adin, and he brought astronomical instruments to China from the West. Not these, but these are examples of the kinds of instruments that he brought. And two other names are mentioned. I haven't seen pictures of them. I just put in this picture. One man, Shams al Dies in 1322. He came with training in math and astronomy, and Mir Muhammad uh, also came with training from the observatory in Iran. The question, of course, that people want to answer is, did the Mongols themselves contribute to setting the calendar or to astronomical observations? Well, the Mongols did use the 12 animal cycle. The Mongols did have folk cosmology already in the 12th century. Probably it was learned from China. That actually can't be proved. But what can be proved is that this man, Yelu Chutsai, who had served the gene and then later served Genghis and later served Genghis's son and successor, Ugade, had predicted a lunar eclipse in the city of Samarkand. And that's, he met Genghis at around this time. Genghis knew that he was an astronomer. He took him to be part of his entourage. Samarkand did not look like this in the 13th century, but you can recognize it as what Samarkand looked like today. The observatory is not built until the time of Kublai, and it's again Liu Bingzhong, the person who has instructed Kublai in so many other practices, who comes to him and says, you're the emperor. It's your obligation, but also your privilege to build an observatory and to set the calendar. And Liu dies in 1274, but the project nevertheless continues. In Yuanshu and in Shoshuli, observatory is called Gaobiao, and that's very important, tall gnomon. I'll show you the gnomon in just a second. This is what the observatory in Dengfeng looks like. It has three crucial features. One is this crossbar. The purpose of the crossbar is only to put up the biao or the gnomon. It has to be perpendicular. And the reason it has to be perpendicular is that the rays of the sun come and cross this bar and then shine somewhere on the third part, part one, the bar, part two, the gnomon, shine on the projection and the place where the sun's rays are cast is recorded, and that's how the calendar is set. Where did this Gaobiao stand? Well, here is the Gaobiao. So here's one of the buildings of the observatory. Here's the Gaobiao. Uh, the Gaobiao is one, and on the other side is one of the astronomical instruments that had come originally from uh, Iran, but it's put into Chinese architectural complex. It's very similar to the back part of Zhengding, Longxing Se, with a large building and two side pavilions. This is the famous pavilion of the revolving sutra cabinet, and not so different 
from a generic kind of structure. This is Shan Hua Se that I compared the Huai Sheng Se to. So here's the structure. And here, as I said, we have our Gao Biao and we have our other instrument. So look at Long Xing Se, large pavilion at the back, pavilion, pavilion. This is the plan where we have this structure. Nothing about it, unusual as it looks, was beyond the ability of Chinese builders for a full thousand years, more than that, before the uh, Gao Biao was constructed. People knew how to build in brick and build ceilings like this in the Western Han Dynasty, and they knew how to build pagodas, and they knew how to build arches and would continue to after the Mongols fell in the 14th century. So what about the observatory in Iran? It's right here at Maraga. It is in Western Iran, Northwestern Iran. Well, Nasser al-Din, when he was here, before he came to Daidu, brought this man, Bar Hebraeus, to build a library at the observatory. This is the first very important fact. Hulagu Khan, Kublai's younger brother, the man who becomes in charge of the Muslim rulers in Iran, the man who is in charge of, of building Maraga, has this man as his advisor. And once he's in Maraga and begins to build an observatory, he has a library which comes from another city in Iran, and then he builds a school. Now, the observatory in Dungfeng included a school for education in math and science, and it also included a large library, especially a library of math and science. The observatory in Maraga included a school. China has had schools, whether they're for the Shaolin monks, and I put in this picture because it's near Dungfeng, or a school where during recess, children come outside and have art class. Schools have been parts of large building complexes, not just monasteries, but observatories in China for centuries. Before the Mongols came to Iran and built the observatory, schools were separate. Schools of higher learning were called madrasa. They were associated with mosques, but not with other functions. But once Maraga was built, the observatory had a hospital, a library, uh, two madrasa, and a, and a mausoleum. In fact, higher education was part of this building complex. In 1970, or in the 70s, it was first, the site was first excavated, and this plan was drawn by an archaeologist in Iran. And the building that we're most interested in is this circular structure. This is an air view. I haven't been here. I take it, took it off the web. Uh, this is the observatory. And this is what I know from the site. So in 1950, uh, an American who was studying in Iran came here and he writes that there was a crack in the dome, intentional, an opening so that the sun's rays could come inside. But these are newer pictures, this from a colleague of mine who was here in the 1970s. And it did have the structure in front. So there's no Gao Biao, there's no metal crossbar. In all likelihood, the system of making an observatory, the architecture of the observatory probably came from China. It can't be proved. But as to the question of influence of Iran and Iranian astronomy in China, in uh, the Yuan dynasty. 
At least two scholars of Islamic science, Willie Hartner and Aidan Saeeli, argue that Jamal ad-Din Jamal ad was neither a great astronomer nor erudite, and Hartner says Chinese astronomy did not undergo any essential change through its contact with Islamic science. Now, the Chinese calendar is transmitted to Iran, and uh, there is a text in Persian called the Zij, which explains how to use it. Instruments for observing the heavens definitely came from Iran to China, but these are objects, and I've mentioned people who traveled. Changes in the system for observing the heavens probably did not take place. It's much more likely that under Mongol rule, the Chinese system for observation and the construction of the observatory went to Iran. So here you see what seems to be a similarity, but of course, we don't have the Gao Biao or the metal crossbar. Now this building, I think some of you know that I've been interested in this building for a very long time in Zhangbei, Guyuan. Uh, there are various interpretations of it. I believe it is a Muslim mausoleum. You're about to see why. It is of the architectural type that's nicknamed Dome on Square. These are two buildings from a distance. It was photographed and studied by at least one American in the first decade of the 20th century. He took this picture so you can see that this all has been restored, but this part was there, imitation bracket set or pure ornament for a long time. To make a point that I've made earlier about uh, other buildings, but here I make it, nothing that you see here was beyond the capability of Chinese builders. I am not suggesting that Xioding Ta was an influence. I'm just making the point that a four-sided building with decoration on the outside and a dome is something Chinese builders could make. Again, we have a text. This is an 18th century text. The Kobe Santingjur talks about this building. It gives dimensions that are the same. It says that it is brick-faced, cubical, and 13 meters high, 10 meters square at the base, with a semicircular dome rising from the center of a flat roof. It calls it several names in this text. One is Shu Zhuang Lo, Comb and Makeup Tower. Well, that's a reference to a Liao Dynasty Empress Dowager who had these lands after she became a widow. This is not a Liao building. The same text calls it Xiliang Ting, West Cool Pavilion. <clears throat> this is an example of what we've already seen. Unusual building with a dome. Chinese have to give it a name to make it part of the Chinese system. Well, Lo and Ting are what are used. Uh, this is the front. This is the back. The inside is four-sided, then it becomes eight-sided, and then there's a dome. These almost certainly are imitation bracket sets, but I've shown you this already. There's this convergence of the bracket set and mukarnas in building corners. People did not know what this was until it was excavated. It was excavated very early in the 21st century. One male and two females are buried there. The male had silk garments. They're in a museum on site. Muslims are not buried in silk garments. Uh, they uh, are uh, except royal Muslims, but they would not be buried in silk garments. They would have this kind of mausoleum above them. Um, 
other dome on square structures built probably during the Mongol period, one in Karakoto, and this one in uh, Amali or Huachang in uh, Xinjiang, built in 1363 for a descendant of Genghis Khan who does convert to Islam. So 1356, 1363, this one in Bukhara, this one in Xinjiang. There's no question that this is the mausoleum of a Muslim. Architecturally, the building tells us this is what it is. But whose it is and why it's built here need to be explained. And so there is an explanation. The building type traces actually even one century earlier than the tomb of the Samanid, but uh, this structure is the archetypical dome on square. By the way, roofed uh, ceramic tile decoration has been found in Guyuan. It's not as many colors as the decoration used in Xinjiang or in Bukhara, but it was decorated on the front. And this is the mausoleum of another one of Genghis's sons. This is in Kazakhstan. And he also was a Muslim. So these are the three Chinese buildings. Whose mausoleum is it? The best interpretation, not my own, but one I believe, is that it belonged to a man named Ananda. Ananda is, J is Kublai Khan's grandson. Kublai son Timur is his successor. Timur dies without a son who can take on the throne. Timur's sons, two, uh, Timur's grandsons would like to take the throne. Kaishan, who will rule, and his younger brother Ayubawarda, who will begin ruling after him. Mangala is a grandson of Kublai, uh, Mangala is a son of Kublai. Mangala's son is Ananda. They, I have no pictures of them. Their appanage was on Shi Wang Fu, and actually an Arabic magic square was excavated in on Shi Wang Fu. But Ananda, although he had a Buddhist name, was a Muslim. He converted. And uh for perhaps because he was Muslim, perhaps because it was possible to execute him, Kaishan executes Ananda and becomes the next Khan of China. So it goes Kublai and then Timur and then Kublai's great grandson, Kaishan. Now, where is this Guyuan? Guyuan is right around here near Zhongdu. We had Hulin, we had Shangdu, we have Daidu. In 1307, when Kaishan becomes the emperor, he decides that he needs another capital, a place where he can stop on his journey between Shangdu and Daidu. And so he begins to build this city, the fourth capital, and then he dies in 1311 and there's no more construction there. But by placing himself here, he asserts his power in this place and he then kind of deflects power from this man, Ananda, who has the mausoleum, this is what it looks like today, open tourist site in this area. So where are the Mongols? There are a few places where Probably Mongols were present and built. This is a contender, but maybe not. This is Yang, This is in Zhenglanqi, Yangchun Miao, where there were four mounds with statues of stone men. They've all been taken down. The statues at one time were at Shangdu, and they are part of a lineage of what are called stone men or Shuran. 
that are built across Mongolia long before the period of Mongol rule. Uh, this is one from Mongolia. It doesn't have as much de uh, deep sculpture on it as the ones that are, are from the Shangdu area. There are also some of them that have been found in Russia. But the ones that were built, the ones that were moved from Yangchun Miao have very deep relief sculpture, very much uh, in the manner of Chinese marble sculpture of the kind that was used at Daidu. It's not, people have wondered if these were statues of the Khans. That raises a question that I turn to. I will try to finish quickly. I think I'm uh, out of time, but I'll try to finish in about five minutes. This raises the question of whether or not the Khans portrayed themselves. And it's believed they did not. This Yang Chun Miao, at least part of it, is believed to be a shrine to a Kipchak, whose name was El Timur. You see the statues in a museum at Shangdu. Another site where the Mongols may have had an impact is Arjai, uh, to, uh, Mongol name, or known also as Bayanyao, in Neymang, a, a site with about 100 caves and 26 sculptures of pagodas on the outside, 25 of them, Tibetan style. And this cave 28 is a central pillar cave with the murals that you see here. And those murals should remind you of murals from the period of Mongolian rule or relief sculpture, Zhu Yongguan, Fei Lai Feng. Inside this cave is this painting. And this addresses the question of did the Mongols ever portray themselves and in particular, did Genghis ever allow himself to be painted? So one interpretation is that this is Genghis, and this is wife and two daughters and his four sons and his followers and uh, Buddhist priests, and that this is a shrine to Genghis. But paintings like this are also at Arjai, and uh, this painting is believed to be later, and some people think, and I think it's a convincing idea, that it was actually during the Ming Dynasty, at the time of Altan Khan, that this and this was painted, that Genghis himself would not have been painted during his lifetime. But yes, we have this site that does show a presence of the Mongols. Genghis, in fact, dies fairly close to this site. I end in Iran, so this is now my last site, and I am back in Maraga. I will show it to you on the map. So the observatory is on flat ground at the top of a hill, and below it are caves. So I'm up here in Maraga, and I'm about to be in Zanjan. That's my final site. The Maraga Caves were studied by a Frenchman in 1934 who drew this plan. This is later excavation. This shows what the, the one cave site looks like, the cave site at Maraga. There is a second cave site also in the vicinity called the Mihri Cave Temples or Imam Zada Masum and you're noticing the number of domes. So we have the two cave sites, and this is what they look like inside. Uh, there are strong arguments that Buddhists were in Iran and were building Buddhist caves up to the time of uh, Mongols and then the conversion to Islam. Uh, some people believe these caves were used for Mithraism, that is, for the ancient Roman religion. To me, they have many of the features of Buddhist caves. These are right below the observatory. But this is where I end. In Zanjan, at a site called the R, that's been known, again, known, studied, and published by Europeans 
since the early 20th century, and it ha this relief has been published since the 1950s at least, and it's nicknamed the VR Dragon. There was a landslide. This area opened up, and here's the dragon, and I'll show you the same picture again. This side has never been published, but we're told that there are two sculptures of dragons at this site. This is a reconstruction. It, some people think it was an outdoor mosque. That's kind of unusual, but it does have a niche here. And so the dragon would be here and here. So here is one and here again is my picture. Here's the other one. Why would there be two dragons on either side of an approach to the, the end of this site. So this is the only pictures I can find. This is later, earlier, it's the same dragon. I wonder if someone who has now come into Iran at the time of Mongol rule is building a cave site and is aware that there are supposed to be a dragon and a tiger, one on the east and one on the west, and maybe mixes them up or maybe thinks they're both dragons. I, of course, can't prove this, but Iran does come into this book at the end because the Mongols were in Iran and the Mongols from China surely had an impact on the observatory. So the history of Yuan architecture in the year 2024, the history that I've tried to narrate, was very different from the history that someone could have written 20 or perhaps even 10 years ago. Field work in every province of China as well as in Mongolia continues, and it's that field work that's made it possible to write this book. I anticipate that the extraordinary buildings, Duning Dian, the observatory, the White Pagoda, will remain important even in 2050. I think it's unlikely that that kind of grand architecture will is yet to be uncovered. It's possible that there will be more White Pagodas in Tibetan style, it's possible there will be more rock carved cave chapels. It's possible there will be another stage. But I think it's unlikely that those kinds of discoveries will change the history that I've tried to, uh, I've, I've talked about this morning and that I talk about in the book. Deeper study certainly may reveal some steely and may change some dates. Research in Korea may identify additional 13th or 14th century buildings. A UN tomb might tell us new things. If another ritual site like Yang Chun Miao is found, that will require an addition to a book like this. And if the tombs of the Khans are ever found in Mongolia, that will require a change also. Some of the questions posed about Yuan architecture 40 or 50 years ago were, did the Yehe Dr build Daidu? Those questions can, those thoughts can be laid to rest. We know that Chinese craftsmen or Chinese ideas of architecture dominated. We know that the architecture that the Mongols patronized during the Yuan dynasty with only a very few exceptions, was Chinese architecture, and it is the physical evidence that proves it. Thank you for listening. I'm sorry that I went over time. Thank you so much, Professor Sterner. It's truly fascinating. Uh, now it's, let's invite Professor Wei to provide his comments and uh, insights. Uh,
非常感谢夏南希教授一场非常精彩的一个讲座，因为在中国的国内啊，有关辽金元考古，特别是元代的建筑考古、建筑学的研究，我们目前还没有一个这么一个深入细致的一个梳理和一个比较全面的介绍，我觉得。夏南教授的三百多页的这本学术著作，前两天前两天寄给我了。我不懂英文，哎，我带我学生们都懂。这个，但是那边的图片我都懂，因为里边绝大部分的东西，大概百分之九十以上吧，我应该都，尤其是我亲自做的、亲自参做的，尤其是我看到过的。你像蒙古国的哈拉河陵，像刚才讲到的张北的梳妆楼。像这个阿尔在石窟那所工作过的地方，袁绍都更说做了二十年，现在是世界文化遗产，对这些东西非常的熟悉，呃，也非常的迫切能有一个学术上的一个推进，所以我觉得，江南教授这本著作也罢，今天这个讲座也罢，我认为是把第一次把建筑，元代的建筑和建筑史的研究啊。从一个研究的角度探讨了这种研究的这个我们要探讨一些建筑的种类和它的特点，以至于彼此的渊源关系，这个很了不得。你像种类上说有这么多啊，你像古城、元代的都城、原来的潞州这样的城，小一点的庙宇、祭祀遗址，像刚才说的羊群庙，那是我一九九二年发掘的。啊，那些石雕像那么漂亮，那是非常高的。这个原在美国大都会博物馆都展出过，啊，包括这些个元代的壁画，包括他讲到了霍城那个新疆的那个马扎，那我也去过，我上去过，非常了不得。上面刻的那门文字，当时我们以为是那个阿拉伯文的，其实是伊朗文的，所以好多事情都是我们。当今我们中国的学者还有些地方没有深入研究的，而夏南希教授呢，做了如此这个深入的研究。我对他的了解是因为过去我们经常读到一些我我其实一直过去做新石器做商周，后来慢慢往晚了做，因为考古嘛碰到什么做什么，越做越后来再晚了。特别做袁尚都这几十年，就得把辽金的东西都要看一看。那么在学校当老师。那学生想做什么，你得跟着他做什么，不是说我要布置他一定干什么，看他们兴趣来。这样呢，就涉及到了很多辽金元的东西。而作为辽金元而而言呢，又是我们目前中国这个晚期中古史晚段这一段上，对中国历史，对中国今天所谓多元一体这个国家的形成，我们今天讲共同体意识，从这点讲。我认为是非常非常重要，而夏南希教授恰恰把这方面做了一个非常好的梳理，他对我们的材料真的非常熟悉，研究的非常的深入，而且他有很多地方呢，看他很多的有有意思的一些看法，所以我觉得在这方面来讲，我们作为中国的学者，中国的学术界，应该这个向夏南希教授表示深深的感谢，也应该在这方面呢对他的。对他的这些学术成就的予以认真的梳理啊，学术上是没有高低的，我们可以探讨。有些地方对的就是对的，不对的随着情况的推进，随着我们不断的有新资料的发现，可能会有一些新的东西出来。而夏内教授这么多年孜孜不倦啊，一直在推进。二零一九年就疫情来的前一阵子，我正好在我人民大学办了一个很大型的一个国际学术会议。我散会的第二天，我就跑到了宾夕法尼亚，去参加他那个叫做“蒙古高原中世纪考古的新进展”。正好我代表中国去的，还有一位俄罗斯的学者，远东的那个馆的那个呃教授，还有蒙古国的一个教授，我们都是很都很熟。我们仨一块去参加他那个会，我觉得那个他在不断的推进这些这些方面这些方面的研究，而恰恰我们中国的历史，我们二十四史。大家知道有中国有二十四史，很牛的。但是二十四史能够记载全部的中国历史吗？记载不了。
，史前的枯铁姑且不说，你肯定做不到。历史时期的过去叫古不考三代以下，就是夏商周以后的事儿不做了，因为啥都有文献记载了。司马迁以后记得清清楚楚了，不然二十四史里边的很多东西，我们在考古世界当中发现的东西，在二十四史里都没有。我曾经问过一个很著名的历史学家，我说：“为什么中国史、中国的文献记载有很多东西，我们想知道他没有？比方说，你说匈奴，匈奴长啥样啊？不提。安禄山长啥样啊？说安禄山胖，会做胡旋舞，长啥样？什么头发？啊，什么眼睛？颜色是吧？他不说。后来我说为什么？”我们这位历史学家很自豪的跟我说：“那历史书叫做常识不输，这常识不用说，但是你要看历史，你就发现了，确实这样，改朝换代，是吧？打仗，修长城，是吧？战争，这个造反，都是这些事情。然后后宫如何长短，说谁跳了井了，这些是有记载。所以说呢，正是可能因为这种常识不输。”才造就了后来的考古学的发展，给了我们留下了一切生机。我们有机会去寻找那个历史教科书里历史记载当中所没有的东西。所以从这点上，我说考古学有无数无数的前景，特别像夏南希教授这种建筑考古学太难了。你不知道梁思成，是吧？你知道中国现在北京大学才有个呃。考古文博学院还有个考古学，考就做做古建研究的。南京大学有一点，很多大学就是考古专业都没有这项，太难了，绘图就画不了，它很难。当然，建筑结构呀、斗拱呀这些东西让你很难。但是毋庸讳言的是，建筑这个东西在历史的发展过程当中，能给我们留下的恰恰这些东西。古村落、古遗址不是建建筑吗？是吧？你春秋五霸、战国七雄留下的东西，好多不是建筑吗？长城不是建筑吗？包括现在我们今天谈到比较晚近的庙宇呀、殿堂呀、建筑呀、宫殿呀，通通都是建筑。所以我觉得这些从这个上面做一个做一个梳理，这个探讨一个一个建筑历史的一个渊源和发展，对我们今天的学术研究是非常重要的。我们今天要讲很多东西，讲民族化，讲特点，讲共同体。你没有这些材料，你是不能说明问题的。所以很多时候我们会在网络上看到很多有些人说这说那。比方简单说一个事儿吧，这在三星堆很火，是吧？三星堆当年发掘，就八五年的时候，三星堆负责三星堆工作的一位，嗯，业务领导跟我讲，我们要命名一个新的考古学文化，我叫什么叫三星真武文化？啥玩意儿？他说。三星指的三星堆，真武是写的真武年，这两处的东西年代差不多。我们想把他们做一个考古发掘，然后命名一个考古学。现在呢，八五年我参加了国家考古国家的这个考古领队班，领队班认识两个来自成都的两位，比我年纪大一点的这个学者。回去以后，八六年他们就挖了三星堆，挖了那个一号坑、二号坑，八七年发表的。发表之后，因为这个。两人我估计是不好署名，还是为了这个这个这个这个创个名牌署名叫巴蜀二臣，两人都姓陈，啊，巴蜀二臣。可是后来我们那是因为配合基基本建设法，在近现在那个八个坑全部发掘完之后，那六个坑加上以后，三星堆是个啥样？但是有很多人说别的话，像埃及人啦，如何长短，短见。你只看到那个特殊代表他当地文化那个东西，你看到里面出土的其他东西了吗？那大量的都是跟安阳小屯差不多的东西。这就是考古学的魅力，它需要搞一个组合，要看到基本的情况，包括里边的有关建筑的东西，都是我们学的。三星堆那个铜人，还有金沙那个手里这个东西干嘛？抱的啥东西？看不到吧？我说是不是抱的象牙呀？金沙发现了几吨的象牙。象牙哪来？哪也不采象，交交贸易还是战争？所以这些东西都给我们留下了无限的遐想，叫不断的一点一点解开，而不是吹大牛说英国人，英国的英语都是中国人发明的，都扯嘛，是吧？现在这个胡扯的东西太多，而且很很多胡扯是一些教授，但是那些教授
，是什么教授，我不知道那叫什么教授啊，想说什么说什么，不建立在基本资料的基础之上的，胡说八道太多了。我到下面想，除了我很赞赏这个加乃西教授，我也很想真的狠狠的夸夸他，他真的了不起。中国人好多做不到的事他做到了。我去参观他的博物馆，真的很棒，啊，那个会议办的也非常好。嗯，这三年疫情闹得门也出不去。好多事情没交往，能组织这样一个活动，给这个中国的大众，大家世界上其他地方能看到也都可以，我这非常好的事情，别开生面，而且很解决问题。我昨天发给我，把我这个这个链接，我发给我的那些学生吧，我说你们一块你们来看看，啊，就是。那么这里边我另外想谈这么几个问题，就今天这个讲座里边涉及到的问题，我谈谈我的看法，比方说。他今天谈到的这个这个这个，嗯，东城，你把原建了这个这个四个都城，最早一二三五年，窝阔台就成吉思汗的儿子，在蒙古国的哈拉和林，建了现在哈拉和林那个城。一九二四年，苏联人发掘了那个城，到后来出版了本书，近几年我才我的学生把它翻译发表了。那个城。我认为是个不完备的城，我不能说更多的话，简单说。后来在一二五六年，蒙古兵蒙古军队南下的时候，在蒙古草原的蒙古高原的南缘，就现在的内蒙古的锡林郭勒盟的正蓝旗，建了那个开平。我为啥这么说呢？就是后来的上都，因为开始建时候并没有把它当一个都城建，因为那块忽必烈还是个藩王，他不是皇上。他不敢借都城，他也没有想到要借都城。一二五零年，让刘秉忠那位曾子聪那位著名的刘秉忠，就设计了原上都和原大都的刘秉忠，选地建成国，三年建成，三年就建了个城，不名开平，那儿建了开平府。到了一二六零年，忽必烈登基以后，忽必烈的人很了不得，他手下的谋士很厉害，说你不能光做一个蒙古大汗呐，你得做中国传统王朝的。皇上呀，于是设了个年号叫中统。元朝第一个年号叫中统，一二六零年，中华一统，很厉害，很有政治眼光呀。十一年之后，一二七一年才建元朝，是至元八年，中统用了四年，然后至元有了七年，叫至元。这中统第五年改成了至元，叫至元八年，一二七年才建元朝。然后一三一一年，元武宗建了中都。在这期间，中间是建了大都，就是我不说大都，很长的时间建了十几年，在京中都的基础上建了大都。今天也讲到了中都有有上都的大都的头都都放上。那么这个过程当中呢，说明了北方民族不断的南下，他入主中原以后，也要学习中原的理智，包括上都、大都的建筑，都是按照宋代以来的营造法式来建的。但是也，我就说，宋代的营造营造法这些真正的应用到建筑规制当中去，应用到都城和大型城市建筑当中去，元代才真正开始。我研究的不深，但是我看到了好多宋代的都做不到这个，而元朝恰恰做到。而元朝因为打通了中西的这个壁垒，道路是畅通的，所以元朝的科技是最发达。不要光看到元朝的蒙古兵的西征，元朝的建立。光看到杀戮，而没有看到这个中西交通的打通和这个科技的发达。你们看到元代的城才是正南北向，知道吗？再往前的城址都坐西北朝东南，因为古代的北就是西北。你要看历史记载，一说由北向南攻，其实由西向东打，因为它方位跟我们今天的方位不一样。诸如此类的事情很多。我要想说的就是。元朝建了四个都城，到元上都才是个过渡性。后来升为都城以后，加了外城，它是个不完备的都城，而大都是最完备的都城，那是按照营造法式，而上中上都却是一种蒙元文化和汉文化结合的一个产物。到了上京，到到那个卡拉河陵，那就更更是一个草原都城，它是在人家这个回鹘营帐的基础上建的，所以这些就。大家到了建中都的时候，最后一三一一年建中都的时候，元武宗建了三年没建成，台式中都就罢了。这个中都没有建成，当年
，申遗的时候要一块申遗，我说这个不能，这个家境来影响上渡生，包括大渎只剩一条城墙了也麻烦。前两天还开的会，因为大渎城墙，所以我觉得。对一个都城，对一种建筑的这个理智方面的这个建筑格局的研究，可能会对我们这个国家这种制度的形成，逐渐的圆满，找到一个轨迹。否则我们什么都说不清楚。还有人说，哦，上都和大都在一条中轴线上，不可能啊！你就上地图上那么粗糙的地图上查一把，查的查的查的十几分，你查了三十多里地。那在一条线上，就有人想说什么说什么，倒是在一个方向，在西北方向上。我要说的是，到了元朝实行这个这个都城制度，跟前面的辽金不一样。虽然他们都是北方下来的，以游牧为主的民族。辽代设五京，是吧？辽代设五就是到北京城了。辽代设五京时候，北京城是南京，但它不是主要都城，南京西京府。西是西是分析的西，天津的京，西津府是一个商贸城市，它不是总都，所以到今天为止，这个北京城建都的时间不会放在南京在这儿，就辽在这儿设给设过南京而作为北京建都的开始没有，他把它放在京的中都上，就是海陵王朝二十河，朝黑龙江哈尔滨那儿把他的都城迁到了北京。把它叫做中都的时候，一一五三年到今年是八百七十一年，那个时候才作为中北京城作为都城的开始，要不然家西安呀、洛阳那都几千年了，而北京大概八百七十年，这也就够早了。但是我认为这一点是非常合适的一个认知，就是说八百七十年才把它作为一个中心都城来看待，就是后来被杀了那个海陵王，这个人很厉害，他最后本来是个皇上，死了以后。把皇上的号都给免掉了，就叫海陵王，啊，那么再往后就是元朝，大都的建立，这就更不用说了。因为这样一个情况来说呢，就是它是这是一种建城市做都城。但你要忘了，刚才我说辽京园，辽京园有很大的特点，它辽设了五京，啊，这个上京、中京，在宁城，在这个八零六七赤峰这一带，设五京什么叫四时纳博？什么叫四时纳博？春夏秋冬，到不同地点上去，或者说这是避暑不一样，跟清代的避暑不是一回事那是要办公的，接接外国使臣，带着军队，什么都有，完全就是一个游游牧的都城。我简单说，纳博嘛，就是营帐，啊，纳博，四时纳博，春夏秋冬做，辽这么做，京也这么做，京也是五京。其实蒙古的早期到窝阔台时期，到蒙哥汗时期，就忽必烈他哥那个。那个年代的时候，一二六零年之前，一二五一登基到一二六零去世，这个阶段也是四十纳，在蒙古国发现的四季雷公都有，只有到了忽必烈开始，他占领了蒙古高原的南园，而且后来进了北京时，他发觉到自己要做一个中国的皇帝，而不是四十纳博的这么一个游牧的状态，所以他改成两都雄信，大都到上都，就走一个地方。呃，春春春去秋还，秋天再回到大都。其实忽必烈也不在北京城住，他在延庆住，那儿凉快。我现在到了北京城，六七月份我也活不成，为啥？热得太要命了。他在北北边高处住，所以这种情况的发展，我们在学术研究上把它叫做从行国到成国的转化。行国就是四十大国，成国就是盖的都城。我前几年毕业的一个博士。就写的这样一个论文，呃，得了优秀，非常写的非常好。说这些东西从建筑上讲，就是一个非常好的一个例证啊。另外还有一些情况，嗯，我提到一些，比方说这些工程里边最典型，我说营造法是意思，工字形变，就是汉字那个工字，什么意思呢？前朝后寝，前面一个大殿，后面一个寝宫，寝宫和大殿之间的中间一个走廊相连。这叫工字形建，是完整的中原式的建筑。而这种东西在原上都城里，我挖了整整十三年，看得清清楚。但同时呢，他院子里边有正房，有厢房，南边好大院子，空的，干嘛？大蒙古包。我就所以我说它是个过渡的都城。所以当年原上都生遗写那个生遗文本的时候，我说一定要这么写。
，当然后来他的有名是马可波罗把他宣传出去了，连后来的土卫六都是拿元上度迦南度来命名的，这对世界文化的影响，包括很多这个宾馆一些大的，它叫梦幻花园嘛，啊，就翻译成迦南度。我在澳大利亚去跟人家说，你这个每天给我喝果酒，我不想喝，我想喝点白酒，给我找来一瓶白酒，打开一喝还是果酒。白葡萄酒，但是上面有个很著名的叫加拿度，酒的名字叫上度，非常有意思，这对世界文化的影响。当然，这里边还有是另外的问题，除了刚才我知道关于中轴线这些问题，其实现在在故宫、明清故宫城的故宫的中轴线，是不是现在这个这个故宫这个中轴线就是元代的中轴线，可能还有些问题。比方最南端那个断虹桥，我一看这桥剩下半个了，故宫里唯一不对称的地方。那半个哪儿去了？把西移了。当然也有人写文章说，那个中轴线可能偏了二百多米。我认为可能不完全是一条线，但是离得不远。所以元代在这方面做了很多的过很多的功绩。另外，刚才这个呃，江南西教授提到了那个梳妆楼，就张北故园那个梳妆楼。当年张北的人跑到元山楼看我的发掘。看完以后，说是这连个汉白玉住处也没有，还不如他们张北的元中都了。我听到他们闲聊了，我说你们哪儿的？说张北的。来来来，你明天不要走，住下，我安排你们。明天我带你重看元上都。看不懂。看完之后，他们就拉着我去中都看他们的中都，我就去看了。看完以后就，在中都没有建成，外城环的不不不太不太清楚。但是呢，他带我去看一梳妆楼了。梳妆楼是啥？叫萧太后梳妆楼，就萧爷爷。是吧？这个耶律隆绪的母亲，就是建立这个禅园之盟的这么一位这么一位女人，很厉害的历史上，这是跟武则天什么也都并列的。我说这个地方，我一看那个建筑在地表之上，拱形的，上面这个方的，还有穷穷拱门。我说这是个元代建筑，咱们写个梳妆楼。我为什么说元代建筑呢？因为我当时在元上都城圈旁边东南方向挖的那个西南方向挖的那个元代的墓葬是在地下的，但是挖出来的建筑的形式跟它一样一样的，连里边的那个四底下是方的，上面是圆的，由方的怎么变成圆的，转角上有套起拱的，完全一样。我说你这是个元代建筑，你好好调查一下。结果一查，周边还有好几个，只不过塌掉了，然后以后个围墙就营墙啊。木营啊，都有。最后这个地方发掘，发掘二三十座墓葬，元代的，元代的一处墓地。说这个现在刚才江林先生讲了，我说这个非常好。对过去人们是，辽代的东西那就随便写说的，但是建筑形式呢，从建筑形式确定它，它是元代的。当然也有一些别的问题。刚才提到那个，有有一幅图《二在石窟》，那幅图，成吉思汗家族图，从成吉思汗坐中间。旁边做一个福晋，那边有两个，这边有四个儿子。他一看，哎呀，这不是刚成吉思汗的事儿对上了。那个最早发在我的那个纪念文集上，一个人写的，但是我始终对这东西表示怀疑。后来这些前十来年吧，我带着学生们去二代石窟考察了几番以后，才发现那个肯定不对。那个石窟面北从南，从南边的门进来以后，有两个后后座墙，然后这四三堵墙和顶部全部是西夏的。壁画，我就不细说它了，全部是西夏的壁画，只有门口进来这一段画跟那些画画的完全不一样。显然，这两幅画是被雨水冲的坏掉了，然后重新补的。他的史料一看就知道了，灵丹汉时期，就是北元时期，进了明代以后的。这一个成吉思汗的家族图。那么尊贵的一幅画，能画在进了门那个小矮墙那个最低的地方，乱七八糟的，这个不大对。后来我们写了文章，我们认为那幅画是这个二代石窟的后期阶段，有这个蒙明明代的，生活在当地的蒙古族的画家画，年代达到达到达不到元代啊。那么这就是我们对一些问题的不逐渐的看法。还有很多呢，这些事情，呃，刚才说的一些这个这个，呃，提到的这个这个，呃，海陵王的南迁呀，包括咱们北方，因为夏南西教授他很注，他一做辽京园嘛，所以辽代的一些都城，辽上京、辽中京
这个京上京，到北京的京中都，啊，还有西京，就是大同这一带，还有很多的建筑在这个，在这过程当中呢，可以留下来，包括一些佛塔，啊，包括一些佛塔，这些东西呢，我们这些年的工作慢慢做起来，比方我在居延做工作，发现，现在我们看到它基本上那个那个经堂下面那个都是个圆形的，我们叫扶博式，就是那个博扣过来，就那个样式叫扶博式。你看那个北海的白塔。也能样是吧？但你要看看比他早的西夏的什么等等那些塔，就他不一样，塔基不一样，塔身不一样，塔刹不一样，而且其实他们摆放的位置也不一样。我小学是在一个喇嘛庙里念的，清代的喇嘛庙，他那个塔是放在大殿两侧前左右的，而西夏的庙塔都在房背后，庙的后面。所以就完全不一样，这些东西都需要研究。大家从形体构造上，我们可以辨认它的年代，慢慢有了经验以后，更重要的是它的布局。为什么这样？为什么走成那个样子？那天我在新疆开会，前几天，这个一个一个一个一个私私人收藏家，他们领导把我领到那儿去了，一看，唐卡，我在内蒙古借的唐卡多了，没借过那么大的唐卡。我说这个唐卡，我就随便问，就跟你们讲这个东西多少钱。可是这张一千万，吓死人了。还有一张小一点唐卡也比我借到大，全部是拿绿松石和玛瑙以及其他玉石，弄成比那个小米粒大一点，比高粱米粒小一点那么大的小粒穿起来嵌上去，一个佛。所以这些东西的研究，我认为。对辽金元时期来讲，对于这个这个建筑形式来讲，是结合它一块来做研究，可能对我们今后的研究会更好。我想，我想我也说的不少了。嗯，总之夏南希教授这个这个讲座非常的棒啊！他这本书我回去还得好好读，有些讲解我得让学生们给翻译一下，有些时候我有些地方我们还可以做一些转载，这对我们今后的研究有有有好处的。不断的有这个。我们叫文明互鉴嘛，这个我们要了解一些西方的东西，特别要了解西方学者们的一些看法。我认夏南希教授是一个西方人，但他的很多看法、很多想法跟我们非常接近啊，好多地方可能和助推了我们的一些研究，有助于我们下一步可能更去认真的做好工作，否则我们自己就做的不太好了。啊，向夏南希教授教授致敬，向他学习。我们今后会努力的做好更多的工作，也欢迎他来中国来，到他喜欢看的地方去，去走走，我可以安排，没有问题。好，谢谢。